And Virginia and I grew up in the same era, went to South Dakota State and actually got a master's the same year and that type of thing. So I was pretty well attuned to the reservation connection with the Indian people and the, the, at that time the Episcopalian Church and the Catholic Church and the Presbyterian uh, Church were had their presence on the reservation as, as well as a traditional Lakota. And so it was an interesting mix. And you know, I've, I've been to uh, Memorial Hills where it would be traditional Lakota in the morning and uh, and, and, and said one, one, one of your uh, the white religions uh, later on. So it, it, it was an interesting uh, observation of how things actually worked. And the Presbyterians, they said, uh, knew right from wrong, but they could find very little right. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so growing up in this country, you, you run across some frontier figures that you later run into that was a historical part of building this area up. And, and first of all, you know, why are we here? Uh, so we have to take a kind of uh, look at uh, our roots and uh, see what's going on and uh, what kind of purpose it, uh, purpose it really had. And I kind of like to go back as far as the, as the reason that we're here at a gathering such as this is John Steinbeck's book, The Preacher of Wrath, when Ma and Pa Joe were getting ready to go from Oklahoma to California during the Dust Bowl. And uh, somebody says when the Okies went to California, they raised the IQ of both states. But, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, they're loading up the Model T, and, and uh, Pa says, well, we don't need that big crowbar, that broken lantern. And, this I take it off. And Ma says, Joe says, you yeah, um, leave it right where it's at because if we're going to get where we're going, which California that is, and we don't have it, she says, how do we know it's us? <laughs> and um, so um, what I want to try to do is uh, we'll take a look at early day rapid and see how it was formed and influence it um, uh, made it what it is. In 1876, we had a lot of the Towns just starting that. Deadwood probably had a little bit of head start because of the gold rush, but not much. And Custer, 1876, Rapid, 1876. You go down the line, Keystone, most all of them. And uh, but the Black Hills has always had a special part in not only the state's history but the national history as well as international because there is an international link also. Uh, on that, in the 1868 Laramie Treaty is still in vogue today. It's still in the papers that we, the white uh, government, either owes land or money uh, to those people in your educational system with regard to Johnson and Mellon Act, the, the commodities, uh, that type of thing. Supposedly, were trade offs at this uh, treaty with regard to making compensation along the way. So, our Indian school out here has been a big vital part of uh, Rapid City over the years. So when I say it's our history, why it encompasses uh, quite a group. Okay, 1876 in February, uh, Rapid is more or less officially born. And uh, uh, the nice thing about this, you, you even know people in these slides, or know of them, that had the influence uh, of this early day Rapid, it releases a legacy of the written word or pictures or paintings behind them. Uh, one, for example, is when Brennan and uh, his party uh, surveyed, uh, say, uh, Fifth Street, which would be about the middle of the mile square that they plotted out, why uh, there were Indian white conflicts at that time, so they built a stockade about where Fifth Street is uh, where Maine, between Maine and St. Joe. And uh, here's a, a, a statement from Oprah Taxby, remembers the last bull team into Rapid City. We reached Rapid City on the night of December 1876, and we're mighty glad when we came, uh, saw a few log houses that constituted the town. They were all located on Rapid Street, which is first street north of the present Main Street and close to the creek. The creek was then the water system. Town. When we pulled in late at night, Father 
who had uh, been there ahead of us had arranged for a house. It was a second home from the east on the north side of the town, close to the creek. It was pretty far. Uh, it was a pretty fair sized cabin, about 20 by 16 and so forth. So here's the first hand account of it. And uh, the Indian you know, white conflict was fairly severe from the population of 200 and rapid, early white went down to 16, 15 men and one woman. Uh, and um, then the government kind of altered the treaty somewhat, and there's an uneasy truce and the struck gold and that type of thing. And one thing that's made this place kind of prominent is Custer. As far as the publicity, 18, or 1784, he concluded here in the expedition and it said he discovered gold, but there had been gold discovered here before then, but more publicized, and he had a, he had a photographer, and, and um, so it got out to the, to, the, to the world. So I kind of divide this into BC before Custer and after Custer. <laughs> on that. But even today, like in the TV, with people, people dead. How many people seem to know better not to raise your hand on that? One? Uh, who might not be a big enough confession uh, 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 procedure to take care of that? But uh, uh, but still, you know, it's on TV, it's in the literature, and they say uh, with regard to Custer and Battle Little Big Horn, Wounded Knee, there's been a publication that they've come out since the battles, and. Uh, so uh, we're sitting in the center of that. Uh, but let's take a look and see what we have up here. This is, uh, uh, back it up just one if we could. Uh, uh, this is about where the post office is, looking uh, east, uh, uh, looking west, I mean, and Cowboy Hill is off to the right. Not a real clear one, but the rest of them are a little bit. So uh, the reason we call it Hay Camp is because uh, they were freighting uh, the big gold equipment from, uh, say, Sydney, Nebraska, places like that, up to the hills. Those bull teams would go about 10 miles a day, but they're the only ones that could carry enough freight to make it worthwhile. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. I think what we'll do is just take a little tour of Main Street to see how Rapid developed. So this is in the Main Street of Rapid. And uh, I was fortunate enough to know, uh, and I remember him in White River, kind of what they call the old folks home then, the Jack Quickle will come off the rosebud where Virginia was born, and uh, he lived on Cutney Creek. And my uncle had a pool hall there in Parmalee. And this was in the 30s. He'd come up every day, he rode a horseback up. He's 96 years old then. In fact, kind of spinning these tales with my uncle with that present of mine to get it down. And uh, he was one of the drovers that first come into Rapid City with the big heavy equipment because he's working for Pratt and Ferris out of Sydney, Nebraska and here. These is what we call a bull train. And, uh, this is what he did. Uh, he says it was uh, Longhorns, they were cantankerous, and he says, and a preacher couldn't drag them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's go to the. Uh, okay, this is John Brennan, and we're talking about the founders of the town then. And the thing that, to me, that made the book is because of the great chronologers that we had here in the form of photographers and uh, painters and the written word. And by every one of these figures, they either had something to do with writing the book or they're the center part of it. John Brennan, uh, he was in Denver at the time, 50,000 people run a hotel, uh, got the gold fever come out here and uh, got tired of uh, the pick and shovel and uh, brought a party down here about where the uh, old Warren Lamb Lumber Company is called the Pointer Rocks, where the slaughterhouse was down there. And uh, 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 his granddaughter, Helen Reed, has a diary. And in this diary, he said, I had the honor of being a small party who on the 20th day of September, 1876, came from the mountains to Rapid Valley. Within the next few days after our arrival, we explored Rapid Valley. And on the 25th day of February, 1876, we paced off a mile square with a pocket compass and tape and line. The center of the six blocks is now the square of Fifth and Rapid Street. Rapid would be north of Main Street. A meeting was called. Our town was in Christian Rapid City and a board of trustees elected for the purpose of administering the affairs of the town. Uh, okay, let's, uh, uh, now this picture, oddly enough, isn't in Rapid City. I, I, I picked it today. I kind of liked it the best. He was also Indian agent at 
Pine Ridge after McGillicuddy for 18 years. And this is where this picture was taken. So here's the value of those frontier photographers. But it isn't a family snapshot. There wasn't any Browning cameras running around then. The cameras were about 50 years old. So you had these uh, professional field photographers out here. And this is what kind of made the book. Okay. Uh, Tom Sweeney from the business end of it. Uh, entrepreneur was one that kind of got the business end of it going to Rapid City. Next one. Uh, Frank Hart, uh, the Cowboys had a lot to do with this area because of the big uh, cattle concerns. Frank Hart, of Hart Ranch fame, was one of the best bronc riders that had in the area. And uh, so here's a studio picture of him. I'll tell you where the originals of these are. They're are bad in Denver because uh, they were so sought after. Why? Here we used to have Jack's camera down here, and a guy come through and bought them, and they're in Arvada. I went down there to speak on it once, and uh, so we had some treasures here that really let us that we let give away. Okay, next one. Uh, California Joe, quite a car uh, frontier character, a uh, book written by. He was a scout for Custer. He come through here in the Jenny expedition, ended up leading it because the guy they had. Uh, got completely lost. He built these closed off canyons. And he says, God, he says, how oh, this country's changed since I've been here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so California Joe, he loped from from the southern states to the Pacific coast in there. And, and he spent time here because of the gold and, uh, and, and he was quite the scout. And here he is in Black Hills. And, uh, and, uh, uh, Here's a little description on him by Custer. He was known by the euphemous title of California Joe. No other name seemed ever to have been given him, and no other name ever seemed necessary. Uh, so uh, uh, he was here with, and he was here before the Jenny expedition because he knew where Claiborne Springs was, the west side of Rapid. That's where that was one of my favorite places. So they camped there, and, and so he, he, he uh, this expedition was a year before Custer came through. And uh, here he's writing to Captain Jack Crawford, who will show him here in just a second. He says, if you can be spared for a week from Custer, come over and bring uh, Jewel and Frank Smith with you. The Reds have been raising Mary hell, and uh, after wounding a herder and a miner named Sherwood, got away with eight head of stock, my old Baldy and the rest. There are only 10 of us here, all told, and I think if you can come with the two boys, we can leave for them in the lower falls and gobble them up next time. Answer by bearer if you can't uh, come and send me 50 rounds of the cartridges for the sharks, big 50, which was the main rifle at that time. Hoping this will find you and your top knot still waving, I remain as ever your uh, show. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, um, um, on uh, this particular, it might be taken up, my uh, son's thing is taken by Mystic because of the live stream in there. But this is Sam Scott. He came to see about the same time Brennan did, in fact, within a day. And so they met down there and they kind of camped together. And he was the original surveyor of Rapid City. In his diary, he says, under the big point of the rocks on what we know as Mammal's Ranch, uh, and that would be where the old Mother Butler Center is. A meeting was held on the evening of the 24th, February 1876, and we unanimously concluded that the country explored would uh, would uh, conclude that the country explored would warrant the laying out of the town and the valley. Uh, the agriculture resources alone, then entirely undeveloped, being in themselves sufficient basis for future prosperity. Okay, next. Okay, Captain Jack Crawford. We had a little theater along the way here, too. Actually, there's another book coming out of him, but it's out to go to historical press this fall. And uh, he was a poet scout of the hills. He spent a lot of time in Rapid Library Hall, quite a performer, as you can see. And uh, he wrote uh, a poem on Rapid, and uh, so he used to perform here, and quite a historical figure. Okay, let's take another look at this. Uh, on, uh, we're jumping around a little bit, but the first policeman here ever was Hooky Jack. And he's the Hooky Jack Saloon uh, down here is named after him. If you notice on his hand, uh, the hooks, uh, the dynamite, the blew both of them off. 
And uh, I don't know how a person could come through that, but uh, but he, he was a nice watchman. And uh, a little description today, Hucky Jack is remembered as Rapid City's first placeman. He had no guns, he had no hands, but as a night watchman, he had no equal. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what I tried to do with this is go back in the old newspapers and find something that relates to the incident. Okay, this is what I found on him. Uh, in a local newspaper, it was Black Hills Daily Times, dated April 16, 1882. It says it costs $75 to cut a man's arm off in Custer City. The Board of Commission, Commissioners of Custer County paid 150 for amputating two arms for Jerry uh, Leary, and $75 for amputating the one arm for Jay Scott. These two unfortunates were the ones recently injured by giant uh, powder exploding in their hands. Okay, uh, great book on the Black Hills, and Incredible Characters of the Black Hills by Robert Casey, at that time a newspaper reporter for one of the Chicago uh, dailies. Uh, says, John Leary, before he came one of the most remarkable pl uh, policemen in western Dakota, uh, had been a hard luck miner. One night uh, he thought out a stick of dynamite from over a hot, hot stove. When he got out of bed in Rapid City, they lifted, they fitted two uh, stumps to his hand, arms. And hooks that gave him a permanent nickname. One of his eyes was badly damaged, the other was a little crossed. He went out and got himself elected night policeman by an almost unanimous vote. He turned out to be a lifetime job. So, so, don't have time to take all of this, but he said once a collection of high school boys celebrating a book of football victory in Rapid City, picked up Constable Larry and suspended by a hooks from a tree limb. But he, even that did nothing to lessen his prestige. A delegation from a nearby ranch, which was Ed Stigner Ranch, a big ranch, came into town unexpectedly the next night, seized the ringleaders and spanked their bare bottoms publicly in front of the Harney Hotel. <laughs> After that, the piece of rapid went on and on to the point of monotony. <laughs> Then Alice Gossage, who we'll see her a little later, uh, you know, if you had to point uh, to a figure that controlled, not controlled, but uh, made examples of uh, what they thought should be the type of living uh, with regard to personal conduct. And, uh, you know, the saying was that uh, God and Alice, Alice Gossage would take care of the unfortunates, you know, uh, but she was. Uh, Married uh, Joseph Gossage, who had the first newspaper here the, for 25 years before he, he passed away, and then she took took over the whole thing. Uh, but uh, she'd be working late at night to write the city journal, and Hooky Jack would come in as a night watchman, kind of as a security man. It said uh, then when uh, he lived to be 80 something, and uh, I think he got killed by a car ride over him. It is low, it's, she says it is lonely tonight in the journal office. For the familiar sound of Hooky Jack, uh, the trident door has not been heard, never will be heard again. I do not know how many years it has come just about this time of night uh, to get a daily journal, which I would put into his pocket. After that, he would say as though he had just thought about it, kind of pulled the Colombo veil. You know, you get to the door, and he would say as though he just thought about it, oh, have you got a match? <laughs> he knew as well as anybody that I had a match in my old sweater pocket for purposes he knew well, and that was to light a cigar that always seems to be out just about the time. The thing you should know about Alice is uh, she was a leader of the suffrage, uh, the temperance, the whole thing, and she despised tobacco and liquor in every way, which she does mention here. And she, but she doesn't apologize for it. She said, I was against tobacco in every shape and form, but it never troubled my conscience to light Hooky Jack's cigar. <laughs> uh, she says, although he had enough miseries to make him grouchy and pessimistic, I never knew him to be anything but cheerful and optimistic. Everything was always all right. So she had some common sense along the way. Court Morris. Um, one of the really big time ranchers. And uh, a lot, in my first edition, I really didn't have the photos to go along with it. I went back to Arvada and uh, 
they had me speak there on um, W.J. Collins, the photographer, this collection had come from. And um, so they wanted to know kind of what I wanted. And I said, I'd like to have some the rights to use some of those images that, that I don't have. And uh, so on this second edition, I've been a lot more on the open range. And of course, he's one of the, the big figures. He bought out Peter Duhamel for $234,000. You can imagine what that would be today. He says, I sent the Duhamels a foot. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, uh, he lived in Rapid Valley, but he was quite a prominent figure throughout the uh, United States. There were big time people would come out and uh, uh, visit him. And uh, he lost the thing that kind of uh, got him going downhill a little bit. He lost 5,000 head of cattle over a Badland Wall in a March, uh, in a May 5th storm. And uh, they come in and told him about him at the Harney Hotel. And, they said, uh, easy come, easy go. Just, uh, <laughs> but uh, Robert Casey wrote a great deal on him. And uh, uh, he runs thousands of head of cattle on the uh, Indian leases, like in the interior and those places. And he and Morris Kellier, John Hart, uh, and the H.O. Ranch, the whole those, had to pay $11,000 to get their cattle off the reservation when they finished in 1902, the Roosevelt Reservation. And uh, at 50 cents a head, so that's 22,000 cattle. Okay, next. 